As we move further down into the swamp, the more swampy region here below the towpath and uh, rich, or Pickway Trail, we come to uh, green ash. Now these trees, as you know, are under assault by a, a non-native insect, the emerald ash borer, which comes from a region in Asia that has a climate very similar to ours and also has ash trees. But the problem with what has happened is over the years that insect and those ash trees and that uh, on the other continent have co-evolved with each other to, to build a defense. The ash tree actually has a defense over there against the beetle, plus there are parasitic wasps that can deal with that beetle. In this country, when the beetle made it over here, it found these trees completely without resistance and without any native enemies to the emerald ash borer, the beetle that affects them. So as a canopy tree, we are losing all of our ash. So it's really lucky to actually find some green ash, that we have white ash and green ash and possibly some black ash in this area here and some blue ash a little further west over on more limestone terrain. But to find this green ash, which really loves swampy environments, still alive, though I am looking up in the crown with it and its neighbors and seeing quite a bit of death. So we don't know how much longer this tree will hang on. I was hoping to find more in the understory. We do find a lot of uh, young ash sprouting and will continue for a while, especially white ash and other forests. Now getting down to this one, we'll see, you can see that it has opposite leaves, which are what we call compound leaves. You can see seven leaflets that line the same leaf. So this is actually the leaf. These are leaflets and that's why we call it a compound leaf. So these trees were a big part of the habitat in these type of environments, and along with what uh, uh, Dr. Gordon uh, specified as an elm ash community, and ironically, the ash are, and the elm are both disappearing from these environments due to, uh, in the case of the elm, a non-native fungal disease carried by beetles, and in the case of the ash uh, disease, where the beetle itself actually kills the trees. A lot of times it's really hard just using bark alone to tell what a tree is. And I think this silver maple is going to give us a good example. Here is a, a silver maple, as verified. The deeply lobed alternate leaves that we talked about earlier in the program on the silver maples. And you notice here the bark is fairly smooth, but as the tree ages, cracks and split begin to develop and the bark will become scaly. And finally, as the tree ages enough, just at ground level without seeing any other portions of the tree to include the leaves, you would think this is not the same tree, a silver maple, Acer saccharinium, as the one that we just looked at over there that actually has the wetland trail sign on it. So, bark changes as the tree ages. And to confirm, this is a silver maple. If you take a look up here, you can definitely see. Hey, this member of the walnut hickory family. This is the black walnut. What we've done as we move through the swampy area here at Canal Park, this, the ground goes up about uh, four, three, four feet right as we reach the riverbank, which is just directly in back of us, giving a layer of rich soil that's slightly elevated where the roots of this black walnut, which doesn't like to stand the water, but likes moist, rich, but yet drain soil, can thrive. This tree can be recognized by the alternate pinnate leaves with several pairs of leaflets. Let's count them here. On this one here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a terminal single leaflet on the end. We'll take a look at this one. It'll help you distinguish it from some of the other hickories and that and 
one other walnut, white walnut, which I haven't seen on the park that's in this area. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a leaflet on the end. And another characteristic of this uh, plant is the early spring flowers with the catkins hanging down. Unfortunately, we don't have any on this one, but the green husk fruits that will fall from it uh, in the fall that are used by squirrels. Appropriate to the swamp woods, now we're just below the dike where the new plant pollinator area is on the towpath trail. In this wet area, and you can see where a lot of the debris from the river is piled up here during high water. There's another tree, this time in the oak family, which is actually the beech family, Cabatia, that doesn't mind getting its feet wet. And this is our bur oak, which is a native plant to this region, and at one time would possibly have been a lot more numerous. The bark between these trees can be somewhat variable within this fruit. So one good way to tell the bur oak, in the absence of the fruits, which is really a surefire way, is looking at the acorns with that line of uh, cilia or hair right around the edge of the cap, is the leaves. And in these oak leaves, which by the way are alternate, simple, but yet lobed, within the bur oak, just about midway down the leaf from where the petiole attaches, you'll notice that each one of them has an extremely deep waist. Let's look at a couple more here for comparison. You can see a narrow part that is slightly lobed, a deep waist, and then a, almost a wider fan-shaped part toward the end. And these are uh, extremely important trees for wildlife within these woods and also several species of birds that are coming through because the number of caterpillars and moths that infect oaks are just numerous which gives our migrating warblers, thrushes and vireos uh, ample cafeteria to feed in as they're moving north and south or staying to raise their young. One of the more common and larger trees in the low-lying areas and originally a member of this habitat of these river bottom and swamp ash elm forests is the eastern cottonwood. Here these trees grow extremely tall, extremely straight, and they're characterized by their fan-shaped leaves that are alternate and slightly toothed. Now generally, even though bark on all trees is somewhat hazardous to get a good uh, ID, these trees, as they get older, this bark will show deeper curls and it will kind of keep this light gray color. Uh, they form, in the, in the earlier this year, earlier in the spring, you probably saw the white, fluffy male catkins hanging down from the trees, which seem to blow everywhere for a short bit. And right now, up in the trees are long hanging sets of green capsules, which will again release at some point soon to release these white hairy seeds which will uh, be blowing everywhere. So the eastern cottonwood, an important member of the elm ash swamp forest and river bottom forest. The original member of the elm ash swamp forest, which by the way we're here in just about the swampiest part of the area right below the towpath trail, is the American or white elm. Now, white elm and red elm are both fairly closely related to the hackberry, but their seeds are different. Not having any to show you, remember saying the hackberry, after it flowered, produced a small round droop. Mm -hmm. These seeds actually produce, uh, these plants, these trees will produce what we call wing samara. That is rounded shape, but flat with the tiny seed in the middle. The uh, American elm, can be recognized probably most reliably from the red elm by the shape of that seed when it comes. And I was hoping I would see some laying here on the ground, but it has to do with, imagine a small round disc with a notch at one end. A very, very shallow notch or no notch should be a white elm, whereas the red elm, also known as slippery elm, will be deeper cut. Well, there's also some tricks to tell on the leaves 
and both elms have opposite simple I'm sorry alternate simple leaves that are toothed well on the red elm or slippery elm which tends to grow in more lowland environments so again using a holistic approach we're standing pretty much in an area where water will stand after heavy rains. I'm assuming, you know, we can make the assumption safely that these are white elms that are going to be more adapted to this habitat. Another distinguishing characteristic is the red elm leaf, if you rub it up this way, is going to be quite a bit rougher than the white elm. But you almost have to have both leaves together so you can feel a difference in it. Mm. So one of the best marks I like is the Oreo cookie principle and here we'll take a section of the bark from the tree and I'll try to get it close when we break it and boy I don't know if you can get zoom in on that you can see the layers of white and dark bark within this little section of the mm -hmm. outer bark which tells me it's a an American elm or white elm these used to be some of our largest more massive trees and in fact, they were planted for years along city streets. Your grandparents will probably remember that. But with the, with the coming of the Dutch elm disease, which attacks the uh, cambium layer right under the bark, where the tree transports its nutrients up and down and throughout the tree by a fungal disease that was spread by uh, bark beetles, these elms have largely disappeared from our landscape as far as large trees we can still find smaller trees that do live to reproductive age so we can keep elms we just don't have the large elms like we just did in the past the tallest member of the rose family in north america this is our black cherry prudus seracina again this is another plant that Original settlement and part of any reforestation. Looking up in the tree, the leaves are relatively small now. They are alternate, simple toothed leaves. Now, cherries, especially some are wild cherries, are a little hard to tell apart. And I wish we had some flowers in there to show you. But on this one, it's probably one of the easiest ones to tell when it flowers apart from other cherries, both native and wild, besides the bark. The cherry flowers will hang down in white hanging clusters, insect pollinated flowers. Uh, like the locust and the buckeye, it's not going to give you hay fever because the pollen that is moved by insects is usually too heavy to be moved by the wind. So this, this uh, tree results not only in providing pollinator flowers for the spring, but the cherries themselves, late in and late summer, I'm really valuable to the food eating birds. So the black cherry here along the pickaway trail. Okay, the red mulberry, the white mulberry slash red mulberry, the white mulberry being the American native is undergoing a rapid transition. There's a couple things. First of all, when botanists tend to classify an area where there's swamp hard, uh, swamp forest or rich top forest, the mulberry is adaptable to a couple of these different conditions. So it is, it is an associate or member of these floodplain forests. The problem with the red mulberry is that, or the white mulberry, the red mulberry was native, the white mulberry is a non-native and it was imported and it rapidly has been hybridizing with our red mulberries producing a tree that has intermediate leaf characteristics so a little bit about the leaves there's not many on this tree yet but they are alternate 
and they are lobed. In many cases, and I wish I could find one of these tiny ones showing you, uh, showing that happening, but they'll form thumb shapes or in some cases, maybe a thumb and a little finger sticking out. Whereas that's the native red mulberry, it did stick that pattern. The white mulberry had a lot more lobes on it. It was a lot more deeply lobed and more lobed. But both of them produce a dark black fruit that is extremely important to birds. Now these flowers, this tree is beginning to flower and actually the flower shape is very close to the berry which is a blackberry like fruit and early in June if you're into really bird watching just watching these mulberries will give you a lot of different species as birds that are possibly even feeding in between trying to fledge their young are diving in and out of these mulberry trees feeding on as many of these as they can so remember the red mulberry is American the white mulberry is foreign they have hybridized, so they sort of produce intermediate characteristics. All of them will have a lobe leaf to some degree. The red mulberry, dom, the white mulberry dominant trees will tend to have more lobes. Both of them will produce a very similar dark blue to black fruit when ripe.